a text from the Upanishads tonight. Um, you know, you have, we good? All right. When you look at a religious body of literature, um, you have kind of primary and secondary texts. And so most people, most lay people, would be familiar like with the New Testament and the Old Testament. But if, if you really get into Christianity, a religion that you know everybody here has to be familiar with, at least in passing. Just being in the U.S., it's the national religion, and so it's like if you're in India, Hinduism is what's on order. Um, so in the U.S., Protestant Christianity specifically is what's on order. So anyway, the New Testament. Um, actually contains the works of the apostles, but it also contains the work of non-apostles as well. Paul's letters to the Romans, for instance. Paul never met Jesus. He had a vision of Jesus. But, you know, his, his works are considered to be canonical. They're considered to be authoritative. But you could compare the work of Paul, for instance, to the work of the original 12 apostles. And then... You look at, a, a, you look at like within Catholicism, for instance, and you find that in addition to um, the New Testament, in Greek, you also have the Vulgate, which is St. Jerome translating the New Testament into Latin. And they actually, they use that version as authoritative, the Latin version. <clears throat> then you go to the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is, is most of the Torah translated into Greek, not all of it. Now, if you go into Judaism, you have the Torah, you have the Talmud, you have a whole bunch of rabbinic commentaries. So when you touch the Torah for a Jew, it's, that's not enough. The Torah, you know, without the additional writings of Judaism which seek to clarify and extend the meaning is by itself insufficient. Move to one side or the other. So you're not in between the cameras. It's hard for me to look at you. Yes, you, Mahabala, I'm talking to you. Thank you. Just that little space right there. It's, you guys think it's like a cool spot to be in. It's totally vexing and irritating to me. You, you haven't done anything. You haven't improved on things. Move way over here. There you go, Chief. All right. I'm sorry I'm not more zen, but like when she's crowding me and I can't think straight, and when you're right in between there, it, it, it bums me out. Um, you know, like with the Quran, you have the Hadith which are a whole body of texts, and depending on which one you accept, what the earliest version you accept is, whether it's from Ali or one of, one of the later uh, relatives of Muhammad, it determines what branch of Islamic jur jurisprudence you belong to. There's different schools of Islam. Even within Sunni Islam, there's four major schools, Hanbali, etc. And so depending on which hadith you accept is really what determines what school of Islam you belong to. And the Hadith tells you when Muhammad said this in the Quran, here's what was going on. It contextualizes what stayed in the Quran so you can use it to de derive meaning. It tells you, you know, the events surrounding that so you can really take those teachings and make them practical. So for a Jew, you need these additional writings, the Talmud, the Tanakh. You need these additional writings. And then Christians don't really get that. They just get 
the Old Testament, which is translated into Greek, so they didn't go back to the original Hebrew. Then Catholics are working from Latin. Most Protestants are working from King James. Sometimes they go back to the Greek nowadays. Um, so although you might be like, what's the holy book of the Christians? It's the Bible. The truth is a, a, like a fair bit more complicated if you want to get into stuff. And so, you know, like a Christian could be like, well, Jesus ate meat. And you're like, ah, you never find the word kreas used in relationship to Jesus. The word kreas, where you get the word creatine from, means meat in Greek. The word broma means food. And so there's no, the word used for, for Jesus' diet is broma. You still got trouble with the fish thing, but that's, that's also, you can do that as well. But at least in terms of like straight meat, you know, you got this Kreas and Broma thing. Now you can argue back when well, he was a Jew. They follow Passover. You know, you, it's like a, it's a whole discussion. But, um, well, you know, then why do they say Jesus ate meat or Jesus fed people meat? Well, because at that time, when the Bible was translated into English, <clears throat> meat meant food. Like I saw a diet one time, an av like an average nobleman's diet from the 17th century. Like 11 out of 12 items were meat. It's like quail eggs and pheasant and then this and that and the other thing. And then there was slivered almonds was like, like the only not like vegetarian part of the meal. Um, so just like you'll say, you know, let's eat rice. You say something like that in Chinese? Oh, yeah. Um, when we say that dinner, like, and then you'll say, like, you ask for rice, and then you'll actually literally say, eat rice, but it's not rice. That's what I just said. <laughs> 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 You're like, wow, me, but I just need you to say, yeah, we do that, and we would have been good. Or like we say, break bread in English. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to eat bread in that meal. You could be eating burritos. You go, let's break bread. Nobody would be like, hey, you're wrong, buddy. <laughs> so, um, anyway, if you look at the Veda, the Veda, and you look at the Vedic literature, it's this complicated grouping of sacred texts, which at least as far back as Manu um, was separated into two types of texts. You have the Shruti, that which is heard, and the Smriti, that which is remembered. The Shruti is older. It forms the core original Veda. The Smriti is, is younger texts. Younger texts. Now, the Shruti, the older stratum of Vedic literature, is divided again into four. Sanghita, Brahmana, Aranyaka, and Upanishad. Which, you know, we don't need to do a whole thing, but within the oldest family of Vedic literature is a body of texts called the Upanishads. Upanishad. Shad is where you get the word Prashad from. Prashad in Sanskrit means tranquil. It also means mercy. And then when they give something to you off of the altar, it's called prashad because it's mercy from the deity. But depending on the context, the word prashad primarily means tranquility. Shad means to sink, like to sink down and become peaceful. So Upanishad, shad means to sink or sit. And ni means down. Like we have the word uh, uh, Ishwar Pranidhan from the Yoga Sutras, kind of a famous focusing on Ishwar, focusing on divinity. So Pranidha. Da means to give or to place, to place. And so ni means down and pra is a modifier. It means kind of like, like it, uh, it intensifies something. And so it means to place your consciousness down towards divinity. 
Sannyas is our term for renunciation. A sannyasi is a renunciate. Same word, sun, ni, and us. Us here means to, to exist. Or to, and so, sun, ni, us. To, to, to literally means like to, to put something in order, like where it should be down. And so, sannyas usually means to renounce the world and run away from it. What it really means is to place the world down properly where it's supposed to go and to stop trying to own it yourself. You get this, this, this more literal meaning in the term vinyas. I feel like I teach a vinyas, a flow class. So that's vinyas. Vinyas goes back to uh, Patavi Joyce and the Ashtanga movement. And that goes back further to Krishna Namacharya. Patavi Joyce's guru, who's also the guru of Indra Devi and, and uh, Iyengar. But this, this vinyas yoga was what Krishna Namacharya gave to Patavi Joyce. It seems like he taught a little bit of a different version of yoga to Iyengar. Um, vinyas means it's the same word, a vi, ni, and us, to place something in sequence. And it was this nouveau idea at the time, about a century back, a little less, to not just teach asanas, but to choreograph the asanas. So, you know, you step this foot forward, then that foot, then you bend at the waist, and you take a breath, you take this kind of a breath, you hold your breath, and you... Spin, you, you and, and so, just in the same way that if you're teaching somebody a gymnastics routine or a dance, you choreograph it and every step would be accounted for. So vinyas means you sequence the asanas so that you move in between them um, uh, smoothly. Upanishad. Upa means close. Close to somebody. Ni, it has other meanings, but that's the meaning it means here. Ni means down and shad means to sink or to sit. So the Upanishads are the books where the disciple sits down close to the guru. And they're old. That's an old body of literature. Several millennia old. And so, at least. And so the Upanishads are part of this core, old Vedic body of texts. And really, they, they, they're comprised of questions and answers. A disciple will ask a question, a guru will give an answer, that answer will give rise to other questions and a conversation will ensue, and that's the text. Can any of you think of another text which is comprised of questions and answers? The Gita, the Gita which is why the Gita is oftentimes called the Gita Upanishad. The Gita Upanishad. Actually, every chapter of the Gita ends with this. Thus ends this chapter of the Gita Upanishad. And so the Gita is actually not an Upanishad, but it has the same form. And so it's generally within Hinduism, it's considered to be an Upanishad. It has that authority. It's part of a, a body of texts called the Prashtana Tri, the three foundational texts. And so, um, along with the Upanishads and Vedanta and the Gita. So, uh, with, you know, we'll call it, I don't know, within the classical period of Hinduism, uh, this, this idea of the Gita as being an absolutely critical text became very common. It, it survived till the modern day. It embodies so much of the wisdom of the Upanishads that it was considered to be uh, part of that canon. Actually, the Vedanta Sutra is also not an Upanishad. It's also not from the Shruti. The Vedanta Sutra is an explanation of the Upanishads. So when you look at the text of classical Hinduism, which are considered to be authoritative, you find that it's either the Upanishads or two texts which are written that are related to the Upanishads. You follow? Number one is that a text which is an explanation of the Upanishads, and the other text which is the Gita, which is a summary of the Upanishads. That's how important these texts are. And they represent not the ritual side of the old Vedic religion, but the philosophical side, the spiritual side, the esoteric side. So I thought we would examine a verse from the Upanishads. 
Om Purnam Adha Purnam Idam Purnat Purnam Udachate Purnasya Purnam Adaya Purnam Eva Vashishate <coughs> Om Purnam Adha Purnam Idam Purnat Purnam Udachate Purnasya Purnam Adaya Purnam Eva Vashishate That's kind of a South Indian uh, chanting of the mantras. It goes on, each Upanishad goes on. Isha Vasya Mida Gung Savam Yakin Cha Jagat Yam Jagat Tena Takte Nabunjita Magidha Kasya Svedhanam So it says 18 verses and this, the verse, the original verse I quoted is the invocation. It's the start of the text. It starts with Om. Om, which is A U M. The three is an A, and then the little doohickey on the bottom of the three, the little backward C, that's a U, and then the dot above it is an is a nasalized M. Mm. So it's actually Om O M. There is a letter O in Sanskrit. Om is not O. So when you see it phonetically spelled O-M, it's actually incorrect. Although I spell it that way also, because it's cool, it looks cool. But it's actually what's called a diphthong. It's two vowels pronounced together where you slide from one vowel to another. How do you, what, I'm saying diphthong and you're getting all that giddy on me. Did you study something? You teach, so you have to learn these funky terms, right? I bought, you know, I wear, I wear chacos these sandals I wear, they're kind of, they're like cool sandals. They're the only shoes I own, actually. <laughs> and so, uh, like I climbed the Himalayas and Chacos. I should get, they should like sponsor me, now come to think of it. I've like, I've gone to the Chinese border in Chacos. Um, but anyway, um, they, 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 they had a shoe I bought years ago, it was called the Hip Thong. And I was like, oh, that sounds just like Dip Thong. That's cool. <laughs> A diphthong is where you slide from one vowel to another. So you start off with an ah, uh, that's the A, and you move into an, an oo, which is the U. Aum, and there's a nasalization. If you want to know if you're nasalizing your M, um, you say it through your nose. Aum, that's how you pronounce it. Aum. So you chant. Um, you see how it sounds like almost like a little Buddhist thing? That's actually the proper pronunciation. So, um, the verse is made up of, anyway, so it starts off with Om. Vedic mantras always start off with what's called a beej or a sound that's intended to sort of purify the atmosphere and set the stage for what's to come. And so the, the most generic and common one is Aum. The tantric literature develops a bunch of other ones later on, but it's like the original sacred syllable, sacred mantra, sacred sound, um, which begins the Vedic mantras. And so Aum Adha Purnam. Aum. Ada Purnam Idam Purnat Purnam Udachate Om Ada Purnam That is complete. The word Purnam means complete. It's from the Sanskrit root Pur, which means to fill. Om Purnam. That, Ada means that. This and that? What's, what's the difference between this and that? That's right. When you say this book, it means something close to me. When you say that book, it means that one over there. This communicates proximity. That communicates distance. Same words are there in Sanskrit. You need these words in any language. You'll find them in any language. They're critical. 
this and that are also used to communicate proximity and distance in time. This time, we do it right now. Oh, we did it that time, remember? It's a while ago. This, that. Adha Purnam. That is complete. Purnam Idam. This is complete. That is complete. This is complete. That is whole. This is whole. You can also say whole. That is full. Full would also work. That is full, complete, whole. This is full, complete, whole. Purnat. The same word, Purnam. But it's Purnat. Purnat means, uh, that's called the ablative. You know the ablative? It means from. It's a way of taking a word, a noun. I don't want to do this with you guys. It's a little too complicated. I'm just going to go real fast. You don't have to remember this. We're not going to quiz you on this later. But poor nut means from the complete. In English, we'll add prepositions. I went to the store with my friend from my house. So you have a preposition, the word, to, with, or from, and then we add something to it, and that's how you form recursive sentences where you're able to stack ideas on top of one another, which is something unique to human beings, the ability to communicate in language an idea related to another idea, related to another idea, related to another idea. I went to, to the store with my friend from my house to buy this for that party on this day, at this time, by the ocean. That ability to stack one concept is called recursion. And it's a unique feature of human, human communication. And it's, it change, it's a game changer because it enables you to form incredibly complicated, complex. That's why we have these massive brains. Um, our brains are so big compared to our body. It's such massive encephalization. And this is one of the hallmarks of it, is the uniqueness of human language. Um, so in, in some forms of language, you just don't just conjugate verbs. How are you? How is he? How were they? You don't just conjugate the verb to be as is, are, and were, and, and you know, past, present, future tense. But you also change the suffixes of nouns, and that process is called declension. So in Sanskrit, you can take a noun like pornam, porna, pornaha, which means complete or whole. And you can turn it into a prepositional phrase just by changing the suffix. So poor nut means from the complete. Poor nut, poor nam udachate. From the complete, the complete is produced. Om, that is complete. This is complete. And from the complete, completeness is produced. You follow this? Now then that creates a little bit of a mental doubt. Well, if something is complete and you take away the full thing, what are you left with? You're left with a big fat goose egg, right? Uh, Pornasya, of the complete or from the complete. Um, the last one was from the complete, but this one would be of the complete. Purnasya, Purnam Adaya. When the complete is taken from the complete, then the complete remains. I'm sorry. Purnasya, Purnam Adaya. The complete is taken from the complete. Purnam eva abhashishite. Abhashishite means it remains. What remains? Completeness. So the sentence is left with om, that is complete, this is complete, completeness comes from complete, and even though the complete is taken from the complete, the complete remains. 
Om Purnam Ada Purnam Idam Purnat Purnam Udachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnam Eva Avashishate Om Purnam Ada That is complete Purnam Idam This is complete Purnat Purnam Udachate Completeness is produced from the complete Purnasya Purnamadaya And even though the complete is taken from the complete Purnam Eva Vashishate what remains is complete. Purnam eva avashishyate. That's a fairly abstruse, cryptic, complicated, you know? It's also obtuse, but it's also abstruse. You guys can Google it later. It's a complicated it's a complicated thing. It's difficult to make out what's being intended. It's purposefully broad. It's purposefully broad. So I was thinking about this verse today. And uh I had a few thoughts. Normally at this point I'd have a discussion with all y'all, see what your thoughts are and then add my thoughts and we'd troubleshoot each other's thoughts and it would be a lot of fun, but we're not operating like we normally do, although it seems like there's been a precipitous drop of new cases and everybody's about to jump the purple tier and things are about to get a little bit back to normal. Um, so yeah. So probably we'll, you know, our numbers will double and triple, quadruple, and, and so on over the, next, uh, over the next few weeks. And we'll stay safe. We'll keep it at an appropriate amount. Um, but yeah, I had some thoughts. So I, instead of polling you guys and seeing where we go from there, I'm just going to launch into my thoughts. And maybe on the back end, you guys can share. Give me some feedback. Um, You know, these texts are authoritative for us. They're sacred. They're rev revelatory. And so I want to give you guys a sense of the body of literature and its, you know, its different divisions and then where the Upanishads fit in that body of literature and then something about this mantra and the real. I wanted you guys to be able to enter into the mantra for all of us to be able to do that together. So I spent some time on the front end giving you guys a lot of background, a lot of context, and also doing the linguistic things so that you guys could get a real sense of the grammar and what's being stated. Um, honestly, without doing this, you, you're not going to get it. If you want to dive into an ancient text, you have to take the trouble to do some learning. It's just what it is. It's like if you want to teach yoga, you have to spend a little time studying yoga. You want to play music, you have to spend a little time with your instrument. Um, of course, with the mathematics of infinity, you can actually take infinity from infinity and what remains? Infinity remains. You can have a house with infinite rooms and you can add infinite rooms to it. How many rooms we have? an infinite amount of rooms. You can take an infinite amount of rooms from that house with infinite rooms. How many rooms are left? An infinite amount of rooms. And so we actually, Indians, are responsible for the concept of infinity, which is critical for mathematics. I don't know how. I don't have much of a background. I'm not, I, I, I made it through Algebra 2 somehow by the skin of my teeth, but I don't even remember Algebra 1 at this point. And the only higher mathematics I use is geometry, weirdly, like when I'm like fixing a bathroom or doing some like full construction work. Then I use geometry. Otherwise, I have no need for geometry in my life. Unless I'm doing like hardcore construction work and then, you know, higher math. Somehow arithmetic is all I've ever needed. Um, so I don't actually understand higher mathematics, but
but I do know that Indians are responsible for the concept of infinity, and I also know that at least what I said to you guys I know is accurate. I don't want to front like I am a mathematician. I'm not. Nor do I want to be. <laughs> Absolutely no interest in it. Anyway, my kids know more math than I do, like 13. Um, let's say that we take this verse hypothetically seriously. It says something about the nature of God, the source, the creator of everything, which is that the creator is complete. It also says something about the nature of ourselves, that we are complete. Good to see you, man. It also says something about the nature of ourselves, that we are complete. Now, that might seem reasonable enough to you that we're complete, but it's worth mentioning five billion people in the world don't think we're complete. Two-thirds of the world's population does not think we're complete. Because the prevailing view of 99 plus percent of Christians and Muslims, Jews don't have to be included because their numbers are so small. 13 million Jews, 15 million Jews, it's like literally a drop in the bucket compared to the 1.5 to 2 billion Muslims and the 3 plus billion Christians in the world. But out of the 5 billion Christians and Muslims in the world, 99 plus percent of them believe in what's called a fractured soul theory of self. Namely, that you're fundamentally broken, that Adam and Eve screwed up, and that everybody who came from there, the, 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 it's the fruit of the poison tree, and so everybody who came from them is fundamentally broken and fractured. Christianity is like based on this, that somebody had to come and pay the blood debt on your behalf and sacrifice and suffer. And so Jesus even the scale for you because otherwise you were going down because the wages of sin is death according to St. Paul. And so somebody had to pay the ransom. Somebody had to pay to save your soul because you're otherwise, your fundamental position is that you're going down. You can think about what this might look like in child psychology. Because you know, five billion people in the world were raised like this. And so you can think about it for a minute. Like imagine if you were a child psychologist and some kid was coming to you because they were all spun out and you asked them to play with dolls because that's what child psychologists do and you watched them play with dolls and how they talked to each other and you had them draw and you saw what they drew and you figured out what was going on with them because they were too young to really get into it with you and do regular talk therapy. And so they're playing with dolls and doll A was saying to doll B, you can imagine some small kid was holding them. You're fundamentally broken. You're going to hell unless you surrender to Ralph. You know? And the other person's like, I'm not that bad. They're like, no, you're bad. You're invested with fundamental malevolence, fundamental sin. And you're going to suffer forever unless you let somebody bleed for you and that they are tortured for you then that, you know, God won't smite you and smote you. So it'd be like a Child Protective Services call, you know? It'd be, like, it'd be, it'd be really heavy. <laughs> That's the prevailing view of, 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 of the theory of self for two-thirds of the world's population. So to say that the self is pure or complete, that you are fundamentally complete, that there's nothing wrong with you, irrespective of what you've done or what you've been through, that your basic integrity is intact. On a molecular level, you're still complete, like water. You can make water nasty. Our toilets are filled with water. And, and then, we take that water that was in the toilet and we distill it and we purify it and it becomes potable again and comes out of your faucet and you drink it. 
all water is sewage because there's a water cycle. So water is constantly evaporating and then it's like an amazing system. The water cycle. It's like this massive transportation system which evaporates salt water, which is sewage, and then carries over the mountains, like super far away, and then rains it down in a place where it's cold enough that it freezes, and it warms up enough that it melts and goes back down the ocean, and you get to drink it while it's making that journey. It's, it's really cool, right? You think about it. Um, you're like water. You're fundamentally pure. And so that means like whatever happened to you or even whatever you did that doesn't corrupt you. It's a pure self. It's a complete self. So if you, if you hypothetically take this verse seriously, and I guess we could argue for why you should take the verse seriously, but I don't want to do that yet. I just want to think about the verse a little bit. We can troubleshoot it and think about why somebody might want to accept this verse, why it would be reasonable to accept this verse. But that is complete. What's that? Everything. This is complete? Like, that is complete. It basically means everything is complete, including you and everybody else and everything else because it has a complete source. We don't normally do this. We have a devil. Again, five billion people in the world have a devil who's responsible for all... And as like crazy as that sounds, that's actually the reality. Five billion people in the world, two-thirds of the world population, believes in a, like a bad guy who's duking it out with God, and it's a, like a fundamentally dualistic system. So then you just blame the devil for all the bad stuff. But then you get the problem, it's like the devil came from God, so what are you going to do with that? Right? So if there was an all-good, all-powerful God, if you could arrive at that through a natural theology, that there was, there was an all-good, all-powerful creator, then God would want to make the best of all possible worlds. And if God, if God was all good. And if God was all powerful, he could make the best of all possible. She could make the best of all possible worlds. And the best of all possible worlds would be a world where we were fundamentally complete. You follow my line of thinking? And everything is fundamentally complete, and good, and healthy, and noble. And there's no true evil anywhere. Everything is good. It's all good, and the real implications of that. It's a radically different worldview. Now, you might think, yeah, those stupid Christians and Muslims, you know, they believe in the devil, what a bunch of idiots. But you can just look at yourself and how you feel about yourself. You feel like you're all good? Don't forget I'm a counselor to most of you. So you can't front with me. I got the goods on you. It's like the downside of like having a priest is you don't get to just like close the door on me and go back to your regular life like I'm a therapist in a box or something like that. You deal with her if you pay her 300 bucks an hour but with me, you get to see me on the weekends and you know my kids and I know you. Do you think you're complete? You feel like you're broken? You feel like you're fractured? You feel like you've done things or had things done to you that makes you unlovable? And don't tell me how you feel like after a three-day Buddhist meditation retreat, like when your belly's filled with vegan ice cream or something like that, and you just had sex, and you're thinking like you're on top of the world or something like that. Not like that. Like, how about like on a bad day? You feel complete, full, on a bad day? So although the, we might be like, well, those, that zany philosophy, it's not actually that far away. 
That is this. You follow? You with me? It's a radically different worldview. It's a whole different way of viewing the world. Everything is fundamentally good. There is no evil. There is no evil. There might be suffering, but that's not the same as evil. You might make, the, you might make mistakes, but that's not the same as being a mistake. You might have some work left to do on yourself to bring yourself back to your original state, like that water that needs to be distilled. But that's not the same as saying something's fundamentally corrupt, fundamentally unlovable, fundamentally broken. Are you guys getting a feel for like the ramifications of like taking this view seriously? And then, of course, if we're complete, we're also individuals, we also have consciousness, we also have will, we also have the capacity for love. Without consciousness and individuality, would there be any love? The answer is no. Love is a force which takes a lover and a beloved and binds them together. But for love to unify and bind two people together, it depends fundamentally on there being a backdrop of difference between the people such that love can bring them together. If the mother and the child are not unique, then the love between them evaporates. Distance or difference or individuality I don't see any reason to assume that that's fundamentally a problem or something to be transcended and that the goal would be to sort of like melt us all together like that crappy butter they serve on popcorn at the movie theater. <laughs> I don't see any reason why that would be a reasonable assumption to make that difference is a bad thing. Variety is the spice of life. Variety and individuality creates the possibility of love and exchange and reciprocity. Also, without individuality, there's no consciousness. Consciousness appears to be in integrally linked in every iteration we've ever seen to an individual who's conscious. Now, if we're complete and we come from the complete, what must God also possess? Individuality, the capacity for love, the ability to reciprocate. And now a personal deity is a requirement because if we're persons and our personhood is not fundamentally bad, you following me? Then our individuality must have come from our source and it must be part of our completeness. And how can, how can you give what you don't have and therefore God must also be personal? Are you guys like think just like the ramifications of the idea that everything is complete and you look at the world, you do what like a scientist does, you look at the world and you see what exists in the world and you try to understand how that's connected to the other thing. Now you know, well how is rape and child molestation connected? Take like two of the evilest things you can think of. Trigger alert, sorry, I was supposed to say that on the front end. Um, Because you have to do that. If you want to say the world, if you want to say something's evil, then you can just throw all that nasty stuff in a bucket and it's like, oh, that's the devil's fault. And then hope nobody's sophisticated enough to ask, well, where did the devil come from? And why wouldn't all good God do that? And how powerful is the devil? And how do you reconcile your dualistic system with good and evil? How do you reconcile them with everything coming from a single source? But if you don't do that, then you have to explain how everything is good. Right? So how's rape good? It's not. But sex can be. People sometimes say, well, rape isn't about sex. Yeah, it kind of is. Because it involves a sexual act. It's a crime. It might be about power, but it's still on like a base physical level involves a sexual act. So rape is bad because it's the forced exchange of intimacy when it's not desired by one of the parties. But that doesn't mean that intimacy or sex is bad. 
And so you're forced to start to look at the world in a little bit more of a distilled way and try to sort through, like, you know, when you say everything is good, what version of everything is good? And now there might be a sense in which, while we're in this world, we're supposed to bring things back to a more pure version, to a better version. Remove the exploitation from the equation. Well, exploitation. Exploitation is about enjoyment, but without concerning the other person. So enjoyment's not bad. It's the selfish enjoyment. You follow? Thinking of yourself isn't bad. Thinking of yourself and not thinking about it. Krishna troubleshoots when he says, I'm strength. I'm strength. Devoid of, devoid of desire. Then you're like, well, where's desire come from? I'm desire, which is congruent with dharma. And so you have to start to look at the world in, a, like, in a, like an essentialized way where you're trying to look for the best in everything, the core of everything, the good in everything. You start to look around this world and you start to find meaning and value and goodness in everything. Is there value in suffering? Yeah. It's therapeutic if you let it be. You can even look at the idea that we have to grow old and die. Imagine if, I mean, just imagine if God was all good and loved us, impossibly so, and wanted us to come back to him and her, but didn't want to force us because free will is, is, is a beautiful thing because it allows for love to exist, but it also allows people to turn away from divinity. The Upanishads say, Matamasa, don't go to the darkness. Jyotir Game, go to the light. They talk about Sukham Atman divinity. Find happiness within yourself. Antar Jyoti, the light within yourself. Antar Suki, the happiness within yourself. Atman Yevatmanatushta, satisfaction in the self by the self. Dukha Sam Yoga Vyoga Yoga Samyatam. Yoga is when you unyoga yourself to suffering. Yoga is the unyoging of your yoga to suffering. You're yoked to your own misery. If you unyoke your yoke to misery, that's called yoga. That's the definition of yoga from the Gita. And so you start <clears throat> looking at the world and trying to find the goodness. And even something like old age, disease and death. Imagine if you turned away from the light towards the darkness, right? But you were never forced to own your mistakes. Would that be the best of all possible worlds? No. How about if you could commit crimes to people who didn't deserve them? Would that be the best of all possible worlds? No, it wouldn't. How about if you had unlimited time and therefore you had no impetus to actually fix things? Would that be the best of all possible worlds? Old age, disease, death, forgetfulness, these things all have utility. They move you, they kind of like make you think, right? Without taking away your free will. And then this beautiful idea from the Upanishads that the material world is like a dream and you can wake up at any moment and you're still you're in the bosom of Krishna being cuddled by Krishna, being held in the hand of Krishna, like even now. That this world is like a virtual reality that we've gotten stuck in with amnesia, but there's always the possibility to take that red pill and wake up. And Krishna's right here, right now, never left you, it's been stowed away in your heart waiting for you to turn back towards the light so there could be a loving exchange. You start to look around the world and you can find gold in quote-unquote dirty places. You can find good in everything. You can find lessons everywhere. 
the ramifications of this verse are, are profound. Meditating on this verse and, 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 and tracing out lessons from this verse is, um, is cathartic. It is for me anyway, and I want to share a little of that with you guys. And although the verse is extremely cryptic and appears at a glance to be indefinite, excuse me, it appears at a glance to be indecipherable and, and indefinite. Actually, I said it right. I was looking at my time. Um, with a little bit of work, you can start to pull meaning from it, to draw meaning out of it. Lessons which are as relevant today as they were at the dawn of creation. Lessons which are valuable to all people in all places and all times. Really heavy stuff. The real basics. Who am I? What's going on? What's the purpose of life? These questions are therapeutic just to ask. Krishna says, just to ask these questions puts you above the ritual followers of the Vedas. Just to ask these questions, to be jigyasu, to be inquisitive about these questions, puts you above the ritual followers of the Vedas. Because it's the fruit of the Vedic ritual that you begin to ask these questions. Okay. That's some kind of like, that's sort of like my opening salvo. What do you guys got? You got some feedback for me? If I was going to defend the ideas in this text, because I never asked somebody to accept a text, um, anything more than hypothetically, without you know, giving some evidence for it, you could look at the nature of self and consciousness. You could understand that you're the source of everything would also have to be conscious. We could understand the universe was created from a singularity. The movement of the universe outwards uh, demonstrates that elegantly. Modern astrophysics demonstrates that elegantly. And so we came from a singularity, but now that we've introduced consciousness as a uh, fundamental particle, quantum of existence, because consciousness is non-material, consciousness has features that matter simply doesn't have, like free will and thought, a sense of past and future, things we don't find in the chemical world. Therefore, the source of everything would also have to be the source of consciousness. Well, what kind of consciousness you go dystheistic, like an evil god or good, but then you could look at us and we could look at what holds us together and makes us thrive and brings out the best in us and makes society sustainable. And you find that it's qualities like selflessness and kindness and compassion that create the most sustainable existence and then therefore extrapolating from our own experience, which is all we can do, if we're not looking from some revealed text from above, we have to extrapolate from our own experience, and you get to the most reasonable thing is that you have a, an all good conscious singularity, which is God. You know, I would go down that road. And then God would create the best of all possible worlds, and the best of all possible worlds have us being complete, and then we start to flesh out and look at these ideas in the light of this verse, and you would get to the same place I just took you. It's a little bit more of a circuitous route. But we would get there just the same. We just have to take some time and move step by step through a natural theology to an all-good, all-powerful deity, and then looking at what the nature of reality would be with that all-good, all-powerful deity, and you'll find a verse like this fits like a hand in a glove with that conception. Do you guys follow that? That was some fancy footwork, huh? That's why they pay me the big bucks. Okay, so that I think that kind of completes the a circle for me. You guys want to give me a little feedback? Actually, should we call it? Let's call for IGTV. You guys on IGTV, thank you so much for joining us. You guys want to hang